In Navajo stories, we have a lot of stories related to Shirok. One story recalls how the Navajo people of this area came from another, another dimension, from another world, from, from outer space. And some, some say from another country. They rode a huge bird. And this bird had come down to here and it crash landed right at that setting. And that's why one of the Navajo names that we give Shirok is uh, Tevitai, which means rock with wings. You can see the central core of Shirvok. Uh the, the middle portion of it is uh, what we think is the, uh, the tail wing. And then we have about uh, two radiating dikes that go southward and then one going westward. And those are what you would consider like the wings of the giant bird that crashed down into that earth there. And then later on, when the Navajos returned from the, uh, the, when they came up from the third world, onto the fourth world we had all these uh, monsters that were born monsters that were devouring the early surface humans that were devouring the early uh, he, uh, holy people that were here so the hero twins monster slayer with the help of spider woman climbed to the very top of uh, Chirac Peak monster slayer hit up there for for a number uh, of uh, hours and possibly days waiting for the the female and the male monster bird to return to their nest. And as both monster birds return to their nest, he end up killing both birds. And you can see the dark street where the shadow is at on one side of Shirok. They think that's the, the blood of the giant bird coming down the side of that rock and hardening up and turning to that darkish color. And what was left behind were all these uh, hatchlings, like uh, all these little chicklets of uh, of the monster birds, there was all these small uh, baby birds that are sitting in the nest along with monster slayer. They began to beg for their lives, and so they were allowed to live. And when they were allowed to live, that's when they were released and they became like hawks, eagles, owls, and other types of raptors like, like falcons. Hi, Tony. We're here today to talk um, about another section of the Sacred Places uh, exhibition and journey. Um, this grouping of paintings was done mostly, it looks like, in Colorado to me, around Mesa Verde National Park, um, Chaco Canyon, Sleeping Ute, Mesa Verde, and Shiprock. I, I was doing some research and I was, I actually didn't know this, that um, Mesa Verde National Park was a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Did, which is quite an interesting designation, but I didn't know that it, I mean, it's the largest archeological site that has been preserved in the United States. How did you decide to focus there? Because, I mean, it, you, you don't typically do archeological sites. You don't typically do architecture. You know, in, in fact, you avoid yeah. architecture. Um, uh, I can't remember who talked to me about it, but but I, it was certainly on, on I guess in one of the books I was reading about sacred sites, um, uh, it was it was cer certainly um, you know was eligible from that point of view, uh, mm -hmm. and I didn't actually intend to do um, any archaeological sites or you know buildings and so on. Um, but in the end, it just got too tempting, really. I, and I had the great privilege, really, as I, as I, as I was artist in residence, I had the great privilege of being able to actually just wander about more or less where I wanted to. And I, I could actually go and, and, and sit in um, one of the ancient houses and, uh, and do a painting. And so I thought, well, that's too, that's too good a privilege to miss. And so Extraordinary. I said, that was, yeah, I yeah. was one of my questions, because I, mm. I noticed in that one Mesa Verde looking southwest from Longhouse, I Sorry. love how the top of the top right corner you have the the rock and it's it it it's it's right in the foreground and clearly you're embedded. And I thought, how the heck did you get permission to go in there? <laughs> yes, so good question. They said we've allocated you a Hogan. Um so come and oh. come and stay. But I think I stayed 
maybe two weeks, ten days or two weeks, something like wow. that. It was only quite short, a short period, but but it did give me great privileges, really. Yeah, I'm 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 delighted that you had that opportunity because I mm. I remember actually going there as a young girl and you there's so that uh, there's something there's such emotional resonance to those mm. structures that are so old. I mean, uh, and so to be able to be in it and physically feel it would be really extraordinary. Yeah, it was, and and. The um, I mean, it was it, it felt I don't know it, it, you you felt that there's sort of I don't think I'm particularly susceptible to these things, but you felt a sort of ghostly presence there somehow. You you knew you were in you know you weren't just sitting on a rock. You were you were definitely in somebody's home. You felt it, and and uh, um, and and that was you know sort of very um, it felt sort of spiritually charged really to be there. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah, it did. yeah, I, I, I think if you hadn't felt something, you would, you know. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's really it's a profound thing, and especially as I understand it, those that structure was built by the early Pueblo people in a, like 1190 or something like that, yes, and yeah, yeah. Um, that's a really long time ago. Yeah, sure, but of course, the wonderful thing also is that there, you know, if you're on the top of the mesa, it can be extremely cold in the winter. And extremely and hot they're in tucked the in, right? They're protected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and extremely cold in the winter and extremely hot in the summer on top of the mesa, yeah. which is where you'd expect people to build build uh, houses and shelters and hogans and things. But down on the on the cliff face, it's very protected from the weather and 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 quite temperate by comparison, really. So that yeah. might have been a reason too. It just may be more comfortable to live in such a place. So in that particular painting, Tony. Um, you included a um, a bobcat fetish that was made by a yeah. Zuni artist. Um, can you explain why you included a bobcat in that particular painting? Um, well, when I was going back from my my in the evening uh, after I'd finished my day working, um, I thought I saw I thought I saw a lynx on the on the trail, um, and it didn't look that much like a bobcat to me, but I spoke to the rangers and they said, no, we don't have lynxes around here. It must have been a bobcat. And perhaps it was a, it just looked a little too rangy and it looked the wrong color to me. It looked a sort of grayish color. And um, and I thought, I, I thought, oh, that, that must be a lynx. But anyway, um, the rangers persuaded me that it can't have been. Um, um, though I still have a residual hope that it was. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought, I thought that's a really extraordinary thing to see. And, and I thought, you know, perhaps it was it was uh, you know one of the, the old ghosts kind of keeping its eye on me while I was working, um, and so I chose that fetish to put with that painting just to remind me of that. Really, well, either one would be an extraordinary thing to see. So yeah, yeah, I guess really, that's true. It's yeah, great. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So much of the landscape has been has been pretty well trashed, really, um, in a lot of those places. You know, where they they've done a lot of coal mining, they've done a lot of digging of digging of stuff up they've, they've and, and a lot of the towns were surrounded by abandoned mine workings and quarries and you know dirt thing that dirt movers and all sorts of enormous rotting machinery um and i got quite depressed actually and i thought this is never going to work uh, and i went to mesa verde um and there again i couldn't because you go up onto the mesa and it didn't seem to me that there was anything particularly aesthetic to it to work on and then driving back down you drive back down from the top of the mesa uh, in the evening uh, from what seemed like yet another dud day um it was it was dusk or getting towards dusk uh, sunset anyway and i pulled up and saw shiprock and and the sunset and shiprock was just exquisite oh. uh, and i thought there's a painting thank god i found one and so that really, I mean, I just kept that in mind as being as being, you know, something that really was worthy of attention and and would suit what I was trying to say. And and so that really was the the spur that kept me going at that time because I I was a very pretty, pretty low ebb really. I was just ready to come home and give up. Yeah. Um. And then I found that, and so I and that's what that's so that became really the thing that made me return to Mesa Verde and also gave me the the 
courage or the encouragement to keep on going. Yeah. Well, I love I love that this is one of the very few sketch and full paintings that I've ever seen of yours. And I'm really glad to have seen. So there's a very small painting yes, of yes. Shiprock and then a much larger, more expanded, but it's the same view. Exactly. And and yeah. I love I was really looking at them carefully the other day, how in the sketch, even in the sketch, Tony, the lighting and the shadows are so beautiful. They're so beautiful. And then, of course, in the larger painting, the sky is very articulated and the the um, the foreground, you know, are all detailed out. But but you 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 really you capturing that light, even in that sketch. And it, 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 it made me want to go there. <laughs> Did it really? oh, that's yeah, nice. yeah, 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 it, uh, oh, yeah. The but colors from, are beautiful. Well, perhaps, perhaps I do think of that, that little painting with great affection because it was the first, really the first thing that I did um, or the first thing that I saw that really, as I say, encouraged me to get on with it. And that big, the big painting, certainly, it, you know, it's a much more ambitious object. But of course, the, and the, the, the trick with that is that the um, sky takes up two thirds of it, and so doing a big sky like that on site is always nerve wracking, really. And, and and to do it when it's two thirds of the, of the entire painting, you know, it's quite it's quite it's quite a, a nerve wracking thing to do. So I was I was very pleased with the way it turned out. I mean, it looks almost too good to be true, but that is what I saw. So so uh, that was that's what I painted. Um, well, it's and, extraordinary, and it also gives you the sense of it's not just this this big rock structure which is of course what people describe when they talk about ship rock is this mm. thing it juts 7,000 feet off of the desert floor yeah. but you still it becomes the focal point of the painting even though there's all this wonderful other things going on around it so the balance you found I think is really extraordinary I I um it was important that place is to the Navajo people, they had a different name for it. They call it Angel with Wings mm. um, and believe that it was actually a bird that whose wings are sort of tucked down. Um, and then it wasn't until um, the 1870s that that white explorers named it Shiprock because it looked like a, a clipper ship. Um, which yeah, it yeah. kind of does, like you know, it's, it's, it's up there sense. on that plane, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I was a bit unnerved to learn that because some people had climbed it. Um, uh, yeah, some, Sierra some, Club. Some European European climbers had gone to the top of it. it the the uh, the Dine people sort of struck it off their list of sacred, or some of the Dine people struck yes. it off their list of sacred places. David Brower and three or other men climbed it and and really it was very offensive to the DNA and mm. and now it's I think since 1970 or something like that it's it's illegal for people to climb that rock right right it's a beautiful painting and I love how the the foreground I know I mean I know you know this but the foreground the 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 landscape slopes you know, like a concave, and then the sky does the same concave. You're good at what you do, Tony. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've had plenty of practice. <laughs> In many of these paintings, um, you chose to use um, pottery shards or shards, mm -hmm. some people say mm -hmm. shards, um, mm -hmm. for some of the souvenirs. Can you talk about why you made that choice and how well, you made those paintings themselves? Well, for all these paintings that we're talking about this time, um, it was very easy to find pottery shards all over the landscape. I mean, it's extraordinary the amount of pots that they must have broken in their, their time. <laughs> because, of course, the, 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 clay, the clay is very soft and they're, they're fired, not fired at a high temperature. So I guess they would, they would break pretty easily. But, of course, they were all beautifully decorated and the, yeah. a, lot of a lot of time and effort must have been spent making those pots. Yeah. And so it always astonishes me when you see you know, the landscape is scattered with pot shirts. Um, I never, ever uh, even, I did pick one up and I put it back where I found it. I certainly never collected any. Um, but I, I got, uh, I went and met the, uh, the young woman who runs the museum at Mesa Verde. Uh, and asked her if I could sit in the museum and, and borrow some of their pot shirts to do those studies. 
and uh, she had stacks and stacks of them. I mean, you know, she, she had box after box after box of them. And so I, I spent, I think, uh, I, I'm not sure if it was two days, maybe, or a day, a day and a half, something like that. I just sat and played with them. Wonderful. Uh, but, the, but the reason that I wanted to do that was, of course, to point out the fact that, that uh, you know, this wasn't always uh, a national park, but it wasn't always owned by the national park. It wasn't always owned by, but it was, there was a thriving culture there yeah. Uh, and had been for thousands of years, and and that we are merely the latest people who happen to have, have sort of taken it under our wing. Um, yeah. uh, but that 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 wasn't always the case, and who knows, it might not be the case in the future. Yeah. Well, so, I'm uh, so glad was, you uh, did it. Really, it shows it again. It signals the sophistication of their their craft work, mm. and and I I like the idea of you choosing them and they're like little portraits, you know, they're like little, yeah. this pot and then this pot and then this pot. And I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. So can we talk about um, Sleeping Ute? Mm -hmm. How did you find out about that land formation? Well, I knew that, I knew that, uh, that uh, Ute Mountain was sacred to the Ute tribe. Uh -huh. um, all I knew, all I knew about them was that there was, if you saw that, that, that mountain range from a certain angle, it looked like a sleeping uh, Native American, and I, I, and so I poked, I poked around until I found that exact spot. I mean, you, you, most of the time you look at it, you can't see it at all. You don't understand what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, and then you suddenly move into a certain point, and there it is. You suddenly think, oh, that does look like a, a Native American lying down. It really does. You can see his knees and his feet and his <laughs> headdress. I mean, it's just, it's extraordinary. I sat and did a drawing. I didn't think I needed to paint it again. I thought I thought it was actually clearer the uh, the symbolism of it, or the you know you, you could read it better just as a drawing. I thought. Yeah, yeah. No, I really appreciated it, and I love the yeah. I love just the the simple sketch of it too. So I, I understand that the legend is that there was a battle between good and evil, and this warrior de deity came in to help and was wounded, and he lied down, and so he's his arms are crossed. Is that right? That's right. Yes, Lying that's right. on his back. Yeah. You said it was um, not sleeping. You it was shiprock that that got you back excited about going to the place, and so as you were looking for shiprock, is that how you found those locations in Chaco Canyon, or is Chaco Canyon a very specific? Place, no, Chaco Canyon is a very specific day. place. Um, it's it, it's it's not Mesa Verde at all. It's it's uh, completely separate. It is quite extraordinary um, because it, there are vast, vast ruins, huge, huge buildings. I mean, just I hadn't even realised that whoever inhabited the place would ever construct such enormous stone buildings. Beautifully, beautiful. Because they're made. great houses, right? I mean. It's Am I right yeah. in thinking that they're... Yeah, they're gigantic yeah. Uh, and they're beautifully made. Chaco Canyon is, is below mm -hmm. the mesas, both sides. Um, and so we, we we followed a route. Actually, it was a Native American route originally um, up onto one of the mesas and then did this sort of circular walk we could do. Uh, and I did that first painting just looking out across the desert uh, during that walk. And then uh, we walked back down and camped that night. And, and it started snowing about three in the morning. Um, uh -huh. And the snow got deeper. And by the time we got up, the snow was really deep uh, and uh, a sort of wet, um, no, not pleasant snow. Yeah. yeah. You know, you look at these two really beautiful paintings of this place. And certainly you can see the weather in one. but. Mm. You don't have any sense of like it's a miracle you got these two paintings, and because in one you even talk about that you hiked all the way out there and then you forgot your paint and you had yeah, to go exactly. all the way back. So yeah. it's really, it you know it, it's lovely to dive dig into the your stories and into the diaries and realize it's sometimes a miracle that these paintings happen. At all. It is absolutely that yes. In fact, I can remember that one, you know, it's sort of every everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And, and at the end of it, I thought, oh, good grief, what am I sitting here doing this for? This is a catastrophe. Uh, and it was only a tiny thing anyway. And I thought I'd sort of lost any any capacity to do paintings. And and I went back very grumpy. And then I looked at it and thought, actually, it's quite nice. Oh, they're it's quite sweet. a nice little painting. They're both wonderful <laughs> little paintings. 
<laughs> and I love all of the the um, the notes and the brush marks on the one um, Fayuta Butte from the Pueblo Trail looking 140 degrees southeast. It's really wonderful, but it's a tiny little, really yeah. nice. It is. Yeah. Really nice. Well, thank you as always for your time, my friend. And um, I learned so much. Mm -hmm. Also.